right, so hi everyone. Thanks so much for having me here today. My name is Chelsea Collier, as Jay mentioned. Um, very pleased to return to Austin Forum. I'm the founder of DigiCity, as was mentioned before. I'm also the editor at large for Smart Cities Connect. So we're gonna to talk today about smarter cities at the intersection of people, data, and devices. My focus um, is really on the less technical side of smart cities. We're gonna do some quick 101s. And one of the things I love about the Austin Forum is that it invites everyone, no matter what your experience or expertise level on a certain subject. So we always like to level set, make sure everybody's coming from a shared understanding. And then Charlie will follow up with a much more technical presentation, um, which I always really enjoy. I always enjoy learning from him. So just a quick bit on DigiCity. I started this forum back in 2016, really as a place to support the co-creation of smarter, more connected communities. So we do that by sharing information, showcasing best practices, amplifying voices, convening leaders, really as a platform to share who's doing what to help everybody move forward faster together. Um, and everything on DigiCity is focused on not technology for technology's sake, but technology as it addresses civic and social challenges. We'll talk a lot about that tonight, just at the complexity of this of this subject. So just a real quick 101, you know, in the smart city space, I serve as an interpreter, I serve as a connector and kind of a therapist for all of these different sectors coming together, trying to figure out what this sector is all about. And so in order to do that, I like to simplify things down to the very, very nuance of what it is. So so this is the what of smart cities. It's data analysis for urban systems. And if you're getting a little bit lost about what does that really mean, this is the how. So I like to think of this in terms of a pyramid. At the base of that pyramid is connectivity and power. That's the foundation of everything smart and connected the connectivity piece being the key word there. On top of that connectivity and power layer is the device layer. So these are connected devices that are taking in data, cameras, sensors, mobile devices. And then on the top of that is the analytics, the software layer, where all of that data that is taken in by those connected devices is then crunched, right? To be able to say, what problems are we gonna solve? How are we gonna solve it? Um, it helps people interpret best, best ways to communicate and think about these challenges and design new applications and solutions. But the most important part of this slide, in my opinion, is the very top of the pyramid, which is people. You'll hear this a lot, thankfully, in the Smart Cities conversation when all of this started in the US back in 2016, there was a lot of conversation around the, the bottom of this pyramid, a lot of conversation around what is the technical applications. But I think that we've learned as we've gone forward that if we're not solving real problems for people and with a human-centered approach that improves life for everyone in communities, then we're really falling short on the promise of smart cities. So this is the question about why. Why does this matter and why do we care? The first part of this is just, you know, really on the operation side of things. Cities have a lot to do. Um, now they are focused on doing more with a lot less. Obviously, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and these are challenging times. So in order to improve service delivery, the right data can help us do that if it's collected ethically and purposefully and pulled together in a way that helps departments deliver that service more efficiently. So I think the garbage example is a really good one. You know, in a non-smart city, trucks go down on streets, they collect garbage, no matter if garbage cans are full or empty, this is both for residential and commercial, but in a smarter city where you're using data that can be informed by, is there trash to be collected? So data co collected from sensors can help you answer that question. And then that can optimize routes, that can save money, that can save time for crews, um, that can save air emissions from all the trucks barreling down roads, lots of different implications. So um, there's a couple of different use cases that we'll talk about tonight, but just keep that in mind that service delivery is a big part of the why. 
But then let's move more to the people impact. So increasing equity in communities, um, I believe, is one of the greatest benefits of smart city technology. Because if we don't understand our communities in terms of the built environment, the physical environment, then it's much more difficult to solve problems. And I know in Austin specifically, there are so many well-intended, incredibly smart and dedicated people who are always wanting better data to help them do their jobs. So I believe that when data is ethically collected, again, um, in an appropriate, transparent manner, and we're collecting data on the built environment, um, that can help us solve things like which areas of the city um, have uh, blighted areas or areas that have uh, can be improved. How do you prioritize? How do you fund those? I think smart city data can help us do that. And then finally, enhancing quality of life. And this is a very high level super subjective thing that is going to be different for every single city. So just to put that in context, I put a few words down here like greener, cleaner, safer cities. There are lots of nuances in each of those words. It means different things to different people. It means different things in different communities. So it is really up to every single community to dictate and to define what that means for each of them, which is the hardest part of smart cities cities. So this is a slide that's hard to read. I'll just apologize for that in advance, but I pulled out some of these that I think are most important, I know, to Austin and to many, many communities, and I pulled them out with a very specific reason. So we're talking about housing, transportation, waste management, food access, utilities, public safety. And when you start thinking about each of these areas and you start thinking about the real use cases of, hey, how do we determine land code? How, how do we understand what is affordable in our city and what isn't? Um, who has access to what transportation? And then how is that related to food access? You start to see the interconnectivity and the complexity between each of these systems. And when you go back to the what what is a smart city? Think about and remember that it's data analysis for urban systems. So smart city technology applied to each of these sections helps us understand what is happening in our own communities. There are lots of considerations. The complexity of smart cities is not to be undercounted. Um, again, at the top of this list is people. And I think one of the biggest challenges challenges um, that's facing all smart cities, the US in particular, is who is and who is not included in that decision making. What mechanisms do we have to talk to our citizens and residents? How do we make sure that we're being inclusive in the design? Um, access and equity considerations should be first and foremost in any decisions that are made. And then there's lots of complexity related to policy. You know, government is trying to keep up in the digital age. Government procurement processes are not always in line with the speed of business. And you talk to anyone in industry and government in this sector, and they can definitely talk about that for a long time, uh, rights of way access. Rights of way is the poles and the, the building sides where you could potentially put things like sensors or um, cameras or even 5G nodes, in anything that is in the public right of way for the public good. But there is a lot of differing opinions about who should have access to that and how transparent all of that is to the public. And then one of the most important topics that I think is really the defining topic for our modern time is this whole idea around data governance and ethics, privacy and transparency. And going back to the first question, who is and who is not included in that decision making? Uh, when you're talking about data that is uh, collected, who has the right to say, you don't have access to my data, or who has the right to opt out of that? And you know, when we're talking about our favorite smart cities technologies, I always think it's interesting because these are consumer goods that as consumers, we choose and opt in to have those goods in our homes. How does that work in the public way when we are maybe not given the opportunity to opt in and opt out? Um, it is my personal opinion, and I know there are lots of people who disagree with me, 
that we should not collect data on citizens and residents in communities that can be linked to their personally identified information. So I'm not a fan of capturing um, personal recognition on cameras. I think it's awesome to capture data on the physical um, built environment. So where are sidewalks, where are roads, where are park benches, where are sewer lines, all of these kinds of things that help us run our cities more efficiently. But I think people are all too often opted in when they're maybe not making that choice. And then the big dollar question, who pays for it and who is paying for it? Are they benefiting from it? So these are many, many complex questions. It is the tip of the iceberg <laughs> to use a trite analogy, but I just put some of these here to help us understand the fact that this is a very complex area. So grounding this in a use case, I'll go quickly through this part of it because I think Charlie has some really, really great use cases um, and he can go deeply into the technical aspects of it. But I like to use a smart street light um, as, a, as a case study because it really shows kind of the before and after and some of the complexity that I mentioned earlier. So in a smart street light, all the lights are interconnected and all of these are controlled remotely. So in a not smart street light, all of these lights are individual. And when you're thinking about, well, there's a street light that burnt out, no one would even know it unless somebody literally said, hey, 311, the lights burn out and you send a crew with a couple of folks on it. They shimmy up a cherry picker, they change the light and go on. A very inefficient use of resources where if they're all interconnected and controlled remotely, you're able to anticipate which bulbs are expiring at what time. You can save lots of energy because you can either flood lights on on ramp up the, the amperage, or you can ramp them down, you can control brightness levels, thus lots of energy savings, you can save money. Um, the service delivery piece and the operational impact of that is pretty substantial. Um, and there's lots of analytics that you can capture. Again, there's some real complexity in terms of what information are you collecting? Are people acknowledging that you are collecting information on them if you are? Um, but I think some of the really interesting use cases are things like you can capture air quality control data. Um, you can capture activity on elements like scooters or cars or pedestrians without linking it back to their personally identifiable information. So um, there are many experts on this subject who can spend hours and weeks and days talking about just the case of smart street lights, but I think this is a good one to illustrate just some of the, um, some of the potential benefits and some of the questions. So I hope that if I've inspired anything so far, um, I would like to make sure that this is kind of the, the quintessential statement on smart cities, which is it is not simple. I really like this quote from MIT Tech Review. Cities sit upon layers of interconnected and sometimes I'm gonna augment this and say most of the time disconnected systems. So here's where the people part comes in. All of the technology applications, no offense to the technologists on uh, watching here tonight, but I think the application of technology is relatively straightforward. Um, the people part is the hard part. So in smart cities, a lot of times you have two maybe three of these sectors represented in decision making, and that is government leaders and industry leaders. Sometimes it's not even both of those. Sometimes there are entrepreneurs involved. Sometimes when there's a research aspect to it, academics are involved, but very, very rarely are all of these people coming together, looking across all of the different departments, working together in concert and collaboration for the community. And let's not forget community advocates are artists and creatives, people who are used to thinking very creatively and, and seeing the real challenges of our communities on the first front lines. I think that they need to have a very special place um, in the decision making that requires collaboration. Um, it is very difficult to align all of these agendas, these incentives about how decisions are made at the government level are not always aligned. Um, priorities, priorities shift very quickly, whether whether that's with city council priorities, legislative priorities, the, the list goes on and on. 
So I think that if anything we've learned over the past two years, I know this has certainly been true for me, is that change is a new normal. And pre-pandemic, I'd always kind of brag a little bit that I love change. I love dynamic environments. I get a little antsy when things get too predictable. Um, but I think I'm going to back away from that statement because I'm getting a little more than I asked for. But this is definitely true for smart cities. Um, we are going to have to change the way that we operate in our community communities, the way that we govern, and the way that we make decisions. Traditionally, the way decisions have been made in smart cities is that it rather sticks with the status quo. We've always done it this way, so we have to keep doing it this way. Um, it is very personally driven. So if somebody brings a solution to the table, everyone's very invested in their own solution and seeing it from the beginning to the end change is seen as risk and risk is seen as bad. Everyone responds to a silo return on investment as opposed to looking at the collective. And the one thing that I think is really getting in the way of very effective smart cities is not seeking the right partners. So we can do this different, we can do this better by inviting new voices, and when you invite those new voices, stop talking <laughs> and start listening, changing the incentives. The incentive is not to sell X, Y, and Z. The incentive is not to have a very simple project that just goes from one to two. The incentive has to be what is in the best interest of our community, both in the short term and in the longer term. These are not simple things to change. It's going to mean that we have to work differently and be flexible and accountable to ourselves and to our communities and to our organizations. So thinking about you know, this little ring with government leaders, industry leaders, entrepreneurs, academics, artists and creatives, community advocates, Kids. Think about how your conversations are going to shift when you invite those perspectives and how your own thinking will shift. And sometimes that gets uncomfortable. So we'll th show these slides. I want to be careful um, about time and, and make sure that I'm sticking to it. But I really think that COVID-19 and the global pandemic is a real opportunity for us to see this in action in real time. You know, it's so condensed all of the different themes that I've been talking about. And some of the COVID impacts um, I just listed in, in the little orange circles above, you know, working and learning from home, digital divide, mobility implications, urban land use, climate impacts, um, our ability to, to use open government techniques and, and applications contact tracing. It's all over the map. But I think it's interesting to think about, let's just choose work and, working and learning from home, because I think that's, that's the, the string that runs through all of our lives and experiences as per tonight. So pre-pandemic, how many of you were able to say, yeah, I can work from home whenever I want, or I can learn from home, or my kid can learn remotely? You just simply couldn't. Pre-pandemic, nobody was even thinking that way, or very few people were thinking that way. Um, another part of it is when government tried to do this, uh, I think, or pre-pandemic, when, when government was considering some of these remote applications, it was all very individual, and industry wasn't really included as a solution. Um, I think one of the biggest part of it, of the global pandemic, is that we've been able to see that inequity affects all of us, no matter what our socioeconomic status is, because we exist together in community and we can no longer ignore it. It's a moral imperative to address these things. So 2020 brought all of this to front and all of a sudden you see all of these, these new ways of looking at things and thinking about things and acting on things because there was simply no choice. This, this was the element of our time. Um, you see a lot more people working together um, and yes, there's chaos, but it's a focused chaos because there's very, very real um, objectives to meet. So as we move forward with this, obviously we're not done with it yet, but I think that we can already start taking some lessons, which is let's keep doing what works and no, we're not all gonna agree on what that is. Um, but I think the collaboration piece of it is imperative. We will all win if we work together. And I think improving our systems and understanding those systems from data collected and using a smart city um, overlay can be a big piece of that.
So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, uh, it's perfectly natural. Dustin Heisler and I created this article called Seven Steps to a Smarter City, and then we turned it into a roadmap, into a playbook, and we designed it to be paint by number, not prescriptive of you have to do this, but here are some guidelines if you're wanting to bring this to your own community. Um, first and foremost, most important, make sure you have the right people at the table. And by the right people, I don't mean a small group, I mean a big group. Naming your values, defining who you're working for and with, mapping your lab landscape. You know, you can go to Digicity, all of this is free. You can download it um, and go through all of these steps. And I'm happy to answer questions if you get through it and get a little stuck. Um, but if you want a roadmap to go forward, this is, I think, personally, um, a good one to look at. So finally, and I'll wrap up here, um, I wanted to share this, this graphic, which I shamelessly stole from the city of Austin, the Office of Innovation. And to be totally clear, I'm not sure if the city of Austin is really using this, but I think it's very, very good um, because it acknowledges the complexity of some of the things that we're talking about here and how this is all a continuum. That's not a black or white, you start off as a not smart city and then you end up as a smart city. This is a continually evolving process and cities who are smart in their thinking um, will design it that way. So these are just a few of my thoughts. I hope this has been helpful to you to set some of the context. Um, again, every community is different. Every city is different. Um, everyone's going to have a different approach and a different opinion, different incentives. And I think that that is a good part of it. If we collect the right data in an ethical way, um, then we can make smarter decisions and co-create solutions in our community. So thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, Chelsea and Charlie. We're going to turn it over to you now. Okay, well, thank you, Chelsea. That was really uh, tremendous. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Oh, I'm getting a, a Zoom error that, let me see, that might disconnect me for a moment. We'll see. All right. We'll see if it, uh, I'm not using sure why, because I, I didn't download a, um, a an update or anything. Let's see what happens. Okay, I'll be right back. All right. Everybody who's online, we're going to let Charlie possibly restart his Zoom and uh, get back to us. Chelsea, do you, is there anything else you would have added? You have a little bit more time, and we have uh, Charlie reconfiguring his Zoom. So anything else you want to add or, or share? Yeah, I think um, the one thing I'd like to share is that, you know, entrepreneurs in this space, I think, represent some of the most exciting work that's that's happening. There's a lot of activity specifically in GovTech, um, but I think that entrepreneurs are coming in and, and really weaving the challenges together and using some of the advanced technologies that we were talking about. Um, I'm getting really excited about folks who are going in and mapping the urban environment, again, ethically. <laughs> Um, and using that almost as like a sim city is so you can you can simulate some of the the approaches to different smart city solutions before you have to implement them and that really helps with getting um, citizen resident feedback and also cohesion between teams so that's a lot of the stuff I'm following right now. Well, I, I do want to talk to you about that mapping thing and what is ethical and what isn't because I probably mm -hmm. have a slightly different opinion than many on it yeah. but. Uh, We'll come to that in q and I'm sure there'll be questions on that. Okay. Charlie, you look like you're ready to go, are you? I'm ready to go. That's the second time Zoom has done that to me. It's like wants to change permissions or something. So um, uh, for those of you who uh, struggle with Zoom, I'm happy to uh, um, make you feel better uh, by struggling <laughs> with Zoom as a computer scientist. So uh, I want to talk to you about some of the things that we've been doing in Chicago with smart cities, um, uh, really starting with how we think about smart cities, which is a nice, I think, follow on to what Chelsea was just talking about, and then give some examples from 
uh, from other cities as well. And Jay, uh, tell me when I'm you know two minutes away in case I go long. Sure, well, Charlie, I'll come back on screen at a, at a few minutes okay. before. So I, what I'm finding over the last decade or so, actually a little more than that, since I've been in this, um, working in this space, is, is really two mindsets that drive smart city thinking and projects, one of which is a very me mechanistic um, uh, mindset that the city is this uh, bunch of infrastructure and processes and information that work together. Um, and there's benefits to thinking of, of cities that way in terms of efficiency and environmental impact and other things. Uh, another way to look at it is the way that um, Arup and the uh, Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities program looked at resilient cities, which I, I think is close enough to, uh, to smart cities um, uh, to be, to be, think, uh, to be uh, worth taking their framework and applying to smart cities. What I like about this one is it's really about outcomes uh, and it goes well beyond infrastructure and the environment to look at um, cohesive and, com and engaged communities, um, economic prosperity, uh, meeting basic needs, including ensuring uh, public health services and then leadership. So, so these four sort of quadrants that um, Arup uh, used to define resilient cities, I think are, are actually a, a nice way to think about smart cities. And these two mindsets change the way that you approach a smart city initiative or a project. Um, if you think just about the infrastructure, I'll take you back to May 28th, 1910, a Scientific American article on Chicago's transit problem. So you can see um, actually some things that, uh, that were implemented in Chicago. We have the elevated train that you see there. We even have these, um, this freight tunnel that's 40 feet down all the way at the bottom and some subways as well. So what did we benefit from this? We, we really, as a city, I say we, even though this was before I was born, but Chicago did solve some serious transportation challenges, and they did so by laying down infrastructure and thinking about that infrastructure and then fast forwarding 100 years after this infrastructure was put down. Uh, you can see that there's an impact in the back in that resilient cities, the lower left is infrastructure environment, the lower right is economic opportunity and related uh, uh, topics. You see a color coded map here, that's the amount of, amount of time that it takes to get to the Chicago Loop, the central business district, as a proxy for opportunity and jobs. The amount of time to get there from any point in the city where green is a really uh, short ride of less than 30 minutes uh, purple might be an hour, yellow might be an hour and a half by public transit. And so this has an impact, not just on opportunity. If you're living in one of these yellow or gray or purple areas, your opportunity for education or for access to jobs is not the same as if you live in one of those green areas. Not completely surprisingly, if you then turn to the upper right quadrant of the Arab framework, which is health and, and well-being, you can see that I wouldn't say that this is, this is primarily because of infrastructure, but it is interesting to see that some of those parts of the city that are not well served by public transit also have some of the shorter um, uh, expected uh, life expectancy. And so you can see here the darker blue, the shorter the life expectancy, the lighter colors, uh, longer life expectancy. So these decisions that are made to make your city smarter or to solve your transportation problem have um, impacts that carry through many generations. And so it's important, I think, to think about smart cities in the way uh, that Chelsea was talking about, uh, people-oriented, thinking longer term than just um, adding technology to the city. Does technology make a city smarter? I don't know. I think this Apple Watch has less impact on how smart I am day to day than the amount of carbon dioxide that builds up in my office here. Um, so we can't really equate technology for with smarter cities. I think there's another danger of thinking of cities in this purely, through a purely technological lens, and that is it ultimately leads us to this view of the city as a computer and, and a system that needs an, uh, an operating system. Uh, and, um, um, that leads to a different way of thinking about the city and, and some of the pitfalls that Chelsea talked about. 
So let's just review from a computer science or computer engineering point of view. The computer has extensive uh, error detection, logging, counters, and other, other sort of um, mechanisms that help you diagnose if the computer is not running well. There's also an operating system that controls access to resources that keeps uh, some areas of memory private from other. Uh, my part of memory can be kept private from Jay's part of memory if he's using the same computer, but the operating system has no concept of privacy. I don't think that's the way we want our cities to run. From a political point of view, a well-designed computer is actually a totalitarian system, and that's not really what we want for our cities. Um, an example of how this can um, sort of go from, oh, that's maybe a good idea or maybe not, um, is this uh, example from the Songdo um, Smart Cities uh, uh, project in, in Republic of Korea, South Korea. And here it starts out with, I think we could all agree it would be useful if the city could know that somebody um, cried out and said, I need help. Um, we maybe would be less comfortable with the city deciding that some behavior is normal or abnormal and then calling the, the police to investigate. So this, this notion of the city as a computer really does change the way that we can think about our public spaces, which are essential to uh, our form of government, to democracy, the public space. You have to have some uh, presumption that you're acting in a public space. You're not being uh, surveilled uh, to be um, uh, maybe uh, questioned later or, or, or worse. Now, Chelsea mentioned cameras and privacy, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, one of the things that we all probably remember, we've seen the television shows with um, this kind of grainy footage of the surveillance footage of, this, of the gas station that gets robbed and, and the freeze frame and the face and, and all of the way that we think about closed circuit TV is from the era that existed until five or 10 years ago, which was that you had a human that was in the loop uh, looking for something in the, in the footage, right? Uh, in Chicago and other cities, you can zoom in on it. If you're in the police information center, you can zoom in on people's faces in the downtown area. And I think most of us are maybe not comfortable, but not super uncomfortable with the idea that a police officer can zoom in on our face in the in the in the public way. We should not be comfortable though uh, with the notion of an AI doing that because that is infinitely more powerful than um, than a human. And so there's no bandwidth issue. There's um, uh, it's just uh, ultimate uh, surveillance. And what we've seen in the last five years alone is on the left hand side you can see you know the person with the monitors and closed circuit TVs. Recently, the city of Chicago ordered. Um, uh, uh, 10 or $12 million worth of license plate recognition uh, systems for the major interstates for the purpose of being able to solve uh, drive-by shootings. But here you can see the, this front cam bicycle. That's my son arriving last Saturday from a bike ride in our driveway. I spent about $300. Not sure if my wife heard that. I spent about $300 on camera and, and uh, you know, a Raspberry Pi running some off the shelf AI software that allows me to send myself a message when a person, bicycle, dog, or, or a vehicle arrives or leaves from my driveway. So we're getting to the point where even DIY projects at home can do pretty sophisticated AI. So um, that lowers the bar for cities to be able to do surveillance, which means we need to think about um, how this is being uh, implemented in our cities. So let me come back to that um, as I talk about what we've done in Chicago and some other examples. Um, we decided to pursue urban sensing in a project called the Array of Things because we heard from scientists and from community groups and from city departments in the city of Chicago about all sorts of questions they were trying to answer and they needed more data to, to answer those questions. In some cases, for example, air quality or um, urban heat island, it's not that there wasn't data at all about those things. There's 13 EPA sites in the city uh, that give us pretty good, you know, good air quality measurements, but they didn't have the spatial or temporal resolution. So we know that air quality varies from 
from neighborhood to neighborhood on a block by block basis. Um, but the EPA sensor that's trying to cover 100 square miles isn't going to give us that spatial resolution. An hourly EPA um, uh, reading also isn't going to tell us the minute by minute dynamics of air quality. So by now you've read most of what's on the screen here, uh, the different kinds of projects that were behind our project array of things. And what we did was we designed a system that would do really two kinds of measurement. One kind of measurement is the stuff that you that I just talked about, air quality, um, uh, uh, amount of different kinds of light that are coming down that would give you heat, uh, sound intensity or sound pressure that gives you not um, a recording of what somebody is is saying, but just the level of noise that you have in a given in a given location. So all of that traditional sensing is really, you know, not much there in terms of um, concerns about about privacy and individuals. But we also found for some of those measurements that you saw on the previous slide, for example, determining uh, the impact of a NAT grade crossing for uh, a rail crossing, uh, how many cars are built up uh, in a given incident where a, where a train is crossing, how many of those are uh, emergency vehicles, how long does it take for traffic to return to steady state after a train goes through. Those are the things that you can't very easily do with a a hose across the road or or um, or a, a sensor that tells you that the gate goes up or down. Really there you want what we would call observations, which are typically done by humans, as are many traffic measurements. And so we came with this notion that we should put cameras and microphones and AI devices out on the pole so that we could examine an image or a sequence of images with AI get what we needed out of that image, and then I'll tell you about our privacy policy in a moment, but then get rid of the image altogether, not even transmit it back to any server. So we call this software-defined sensing uh, because uh, there's a concept called soft software-defined radio, um, uh, which is um, that your a software-defined radio it will talk to a cellular network, will talk to FM or listen or, or transmit FM, um, whatever format that you want, just based on not the hardware inside, but the program that it's running. In the same fa uh, fashion here, we have uh, cameras out on the pole with uh, computers that can do AI or other kinds of programming. And what that camera is measuring or what that microphone is measuring, maybe the microphone is just measuring the number of times in a 30 second period that the decibels go above a certain amount for a certain period of time. Or maybe uh, a accelerometer is just measuring average vibration. Those are all defined by the software that we write and push out to the node. So this idea of software-defined sensors um, makes these devices in some sense much more powerful than a typical closed circuit uh, a TV uh, network. And so we thought from the very architecture of the system about how could we protect residents of the city of Chicago or else, elsewhere that these might be installed, how can we protect their privacy um, over a long period of time, even if we're all moved on and someone else is running the project, even if the cameras get a million times better than they are today, what sort of privacy policy might we have that would allow us to, to protect privacy over time? Um, here you can see north is to the left because Chicago is portrait, not landscape uh, in terms of its layout. And you can see a couple of things. One, of course, the extent of the project, um, but the other is along the left-hand side there, just examples of, th these slides will be available later, but just examples of the projects that we were working with. Uh, uh, for example, a project called Vision Zero up at the top there, which was, um, is a project uh, about pedestrian safety or, or vehicle and pedestrian safety. And they wanted 40 locations that were the, the locations in the city that had the highest numbers of fatalities from traffic related uh, injuries. And so uh, that was one of the things that drove, one of the projects that drove the, the location of these devices. And so each of the colors that you see there are different projects that uh, you can see the green squares along the lakefront and then a transect that goes from top to bottom, but it's actually east-west. Um, that's about the impact of the lake on uh, the lake effect on air quality and um, uh, and urban heat island and and weather. 
then you can see those yellow stars. You can kind of see a line left to right there um, about mid screen, a line of stars. That's Ashland Avenue, where there's a plan for a, a rapid bus transit along there. So each of the different colors there you can see is supporting a different kind of inquiry into the city. So I mentioned privacy. Um, here's the devices. You can see there's a camera pointed up and one pointed down. And we developed um, a process, an architecture, a set of policies that would essentially, we think, protect over a long period of time the privacy of individuals that uh, might be captured in one of these images. So the, the four steps of this privacy policy are number one, before we do anything with an image, we're looking for birds or we're looking for um, people or red, uh, red trucks, whatever it is that we're looking for, there's an approval process that says, yes, looking for red trucks is okay. You can put that software out there. Once the software looks for a red truck in the image and counts the number of red trucks, the image is deleted. So within minutes of the image being taken, it gets deleted. Um, there's a, uh, this pre-approved measurement means that I can collect the number of red trucks from time to time, every 30 seconds or whatever I want. And then that means I can report an integer number of red trucks and I can't report anything else. Can't report a license plate number. I uh, can't report, um, you know, the vehicle make if that's not part of what's approved. And so there's a very strict control of what software goes out into that software defined sensor. Uh, another talk I can give on the security of the devices, which is is uh, critical to to this policy working. And then uh, underpinning this is a set of accountability structures, including external review and um, public um, publicly dis disclosed uh, interactions on that accountability review, which you've never actually had to implement. But let's say D Jay decided he wanted to um, uh, do some kind of a image processing on this and our external security and privacy team that looked at that would say, well, no, because that violates people's privacy or could violate people's privacy in this way or that. We might say, well, yeah, but we don't report to you. We report to the National Science Foundation who's funded the project. So we're gonna do that anyway. Um, it allows us to have accountability, but that whole exchange, the proposal, the review process and our response to it is, is mandated to be happening in the public. And so we could be called uh, to account to say, well, your own privacy people said not to do this, but you did it anyway. So there's those kind of um, uh, incentives and accountability that are um, that are built into the hardware and the software and, and the process for running it. Now, we didn't really think about um, this particular case, but I thought it would be interesting to see that um, just because you have a, um, a set of cameras that are uh, supposedly just looking for certain things, if you don't have this kind of privacy policy published with, with accountability, then things can kind of slide. So when San Diego first put these cameras in, um, none of the articles that I read years ago had anything about uh, the cops using it to uh, identify protesters in, uh, in, in uh, public uh, uh, protests. And yet uh, here we find ourselves and found ourselves in 2020 with some of the Black Lives Matters uh, uh, protesters being identified using these cameras. And then you can see the headline here, the, the mayor shutting those things off. So we've, we, we did not want to be in the situation that San Diego was in where you'd have mission creep in the use of the cameras. And that was one of the things that we tried to design in back in 2016 when we designed these, um, these policies. Now, uh, I talked about um, software-defined sensors. I want to give you a couple of ex examples. This is one from Northern Illinois University. And you can see they're allowed to collect um, really four things. One are the counts of pedestrians, how many cross the street, how many use this crosswalk. And the second thing that they're allowed to collect is the pathway that those individuals take without associating obviously with the individual because they're not doing any facial recognition or anything like that. So that is an example of a, of a project that was approved and went out um, and has those kind of constraints uh, around it. Um, a couple of other examples from other cities. Uh, um, I've been, for the last few years, collaborating with a number of groups in Taipei, Taiwan, at Academia Sinica, uh, one of which has been 
uh, a project that's uh, run by Mark uh, uh, Liao uh, has been looking at how to use just regular uh, two things. One, how to use just a regular low resolution uh, CCTV that exists in Taiwan already to get an idea of things like um, uh, uh, traffic density, uh, uh, traffic speed, and, and other things. The other part of the project is to, to similar to the array of things, to put AI into a this fisheye lens camera here to be able to do vehicle detection, uh, length of car queue, cop, length of the queues that the cars are in, similar things that I mentioned before uh, when I was talking about at-grade uh, rail crossing. So that, but they've actually built this into a chip with a camera um, that they then can can uh, deploy at an intersection with a. You can see that whole range of the entire intersection in contrast to that more directional that you see with the array of things. So this is along with our privacy policy, something we would love uh, to get into Chicago. Another example from ta Taipei, and I'll start to maybe move toward examples that are more um, environmental and not so much the AI um, image processing. Um, here, uh, uh, LJ Chen has over the last five years or so deployed on the order of $10,000 air quality devices. They just measure particulate matter, in this case, PM 2.5, uh, which is the particles that are 2.5 micron um, that go straight into your, you can't see them or smell, well, maybe you could smell them, but you can't see them, they go straight into your bloodstream through your lungs. So these are, uh, these have a huge impact on, on health. And he's been able to use AI in this case uh, to smooth out some of the artifacts that are associated with lower cost air quality sensors and get some very good results in looking at not just the instantaneous um, uh, cloud of, of PM 2.5 that might be at the island, but also uh, these clouds as they clouds of PM 2.5 as they as they move across the island. I want to give one more example of another city. This is a project by Juan Bello and others at NYU that has been going on for about the last five years or so. And it's a it's really nice project where if you've seen the upper right, um, that little device with the pigeon, uh, uh, the pigeon uh, um, discourager pi uh, spikes on top, that is another hundred dollar device. And all it's doing is, is listening to sound, but it's doing a slight, a small amount of AI at the edge there, and then sending these vector, the, sending these data back to the cloud so that there they can uh, look at the types of noise that are happening, not just the, um, uh, the volume of noise, but also having trained these algorithms, they can say, well, this is construction noise, this is a jackhammer, or um, this is noise from traffic, or this is a uh, human crowd noise or a barking dog. And so, so another project where they were able to do a lot of very useful things for, for the city of New York uh, with just a hundred dollar sensor and, and a, a decent microphone on it. Um, with these kind of sensors, um, uh, you can see the construction scene in the upper right, uh, they're able to monitor the construction site to make sure that they're not starting before they're allowed, starting to work in the morning before they're allowed to or, or working too long with the noise. So, so very nice projects, these um, uh, lot, a lot that you could do with low cost sensors. Uh, finally, on the low cost sensor uh, uh, front, we partnered with uh, Microsoft Research uh, about a year and a half ago. They had this thing that, that you can see there, it's the shape of a leaf, it's about the size of a bagel, um, or since this is Austin, the size of a small burrito. Um, they, Microsoft Research came to us and I said, I love this device for two reasons. Number one, it has no wires. Um, and number two, it has no wires. <laughs> so it's cellular connected and it's uh, solar powered. So that means it can go anywhere. Uh, and what we did was we, we called up JC to co JC to co operates 2,600 bus shelters among other infrastructure in Chicago. And they'd been offering us the array of things project. Uh, they, they had repeatedly said over the last few years, that anytime you want to put something up on bus shelters, we would love to work with you to do that. So I brought uh, Microsoft Research together with um, JC Co, and we said, hey, let's deploy 100 of your devices in Chicago. Now, the other thing I really like about the device besides the technology is you can see there's a, a QR code right there. Um, they have this very nice user interface. Uh, that's 
what you see there is a, it's about a four by nine inch sticker that goes on the bus shelter where there is one of these devices. And you can scan that QR code and get information about air quality in general, see the graph of air quality at the place you're at, look at the graph of the whole city. And in order to decide where to put a hundred of these, we, Microsoft uh, Research, myself and others, including the Chicago Department of Public Health, worked with the Environmental Law and Policy Center and a number of different community groups to get them involved in helping us determine not just, although we did use machine learning algorithms to figure out where to place these devices, we really worked with the community um, because they had already been concerned about air quality and measuring air quality in their, um, in their neighborhoods. And so we ended up with a hundred locations. Um, you can see there's a sort of a color code here. Some of them we put in high traffic, high population, we looked at high traffic, low population, and low traffic, high. So these sort of four cases here, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a decent coverage of the city. Uh, we have devices that are co-located with um, EPA sites. And so that is um, um, uh, just a project that, well, was, was supposed to happen last year, but COVID. And, and so we, uh, we finally got it up and running about, about a month ago. And really, um, I'll sort of close off here um, by talking about where the array of things is going. We did get for the array of things project, it was a $3 million NSF uh, National Science Foundation project for a prototyping effort, which we then did. You can see on the left, the 150 or so array of things devices. Um, we then went about a year and a half, two years ago and had a project that started a year and a half ago that's three times larger, a $9 million project to really focus on um, taking the AI at the edge and making it more generally useful, uh, a more of a general purpose system that any scientist could write software, send it to us, we would review it and they could deploy it across the devices, not just in cities, but in the uh, wilderness areas and something called the National Ecological Observatory Network in a, another project called Wi-Fi that Jay is familiar with the project and probably knows most of the people involved in Southern California. They have a hundred towers around the Southern California um, uh, wilderness that give first responders to wildfires uh, information. All of these projects with this AI at the edge are um, aiming at what can we do by putting intelligence out at the edge and taking the human out of the loop to better measure our environment, whether that's an urban environment or a natural environment. So moving forward, the Array of Things has this um, uh, initiative with Microsoft and others in hundreds of low-cost air quality sensors. A hundred is just to get started. Uh, and then uh, another initiative that is getting even more and more powerful devices out there. And again, within within all of the privacy policies that, that we already developed. So let me close here with a, a project that has nothing to do with sensors, but it's a really nice example of a city being smarter. In this case, the city is Austin. Um, and this is, you can see from uh, last, uh, uh, last year, um, what Austin was doing and is a presumably still doing is, is def uh, Austin defined these um, four postures, if you will, for COVID-19, yellow, orange, and blue. So I guess three postures uh, for COVID-19. The most uh, strict uh, one would be the orange uh, when we're talking about you know, stay-at-home orders and things like that. The most open one would be blue, where people are still social distancing, but, but going about their, you know, their, their normal routine. And what Austin did was to watch uh, a couple of things. One is to look at what's the hospital capacity in terms of uh, uh, overall capacity plus uh, ICU beds. And then they determined a safety threshold that they would use to uh, try to bend the curve. That was the, the goal last year and still is uh, to some extent. Um, and to, do, to, to drive their, their stay at home or not stay at home, their different policies based on hospital admissions. And when those hospital admissions would go above a certain threshold or below a certain threshold, then that would trigger a change. And so you can see that uh, when the, the blue line, which is hospital admissions, crossed the orange line, then uh, the posture went from yellow to orange. And when it went down in November, December of 2020, below that orange line, 
then the city was able to relax to from orange to yellow, a temporary go back up into uh, orange. And then you can see uh, uh, more recently uh, in 2021 down, uh, down uh, in the more normal uh, everyday life uh, uh, sort of regime. So I, I think of this, if I go back to the, the four quadrants of the Arab, Arab um, resilience framework, the upper left here is uh, strategic planning and leadership. And this, I think, is an example of using the data that was available to the city to, uh, to drive a, a smart set of uh, policies. So I'm going to close there. I don't know how we're doing on time, but we'll... Um, uh, we're doing we'll great on time, actually, which is awesome because we have tons of good questions in Slack. And I want to make sure we get to as many of these as possible. I had a difficult time picking my favorite. Hopefully it doesn't change between now and 20 minutes from now, um, but uh, I have one, but it was very difficult. So let's, let's jump to the questions. Chelsea, Charlie, thank you very much. Um, you can probably guess what some of these questions are gonna be about, but I'm gonna select a random sample of great ones and I see more are coming in trying to win that South by Southwest badge. Um, all right. Um, Ryan Daniel asked a great question, very pragmatic question. Who is the project manager to get the different stakeholders together to produce the smart street lights and produce the system to sustain them? And I'm gonna ask you to talk about that a little bit more generally. Who is the project manager or managers for smart city projects with so many stakeholders? How do these get done? I can answer that on a general level, but I think Charlie can answer it on a more specific level based on some of the awesome examples that you provided. So maybe Charlie goes first and I can add some sure. color commentary. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, you know, the, I'll, I'll say what happened in Chicago. There, there was a partnership that we started with the city of Chicago that, that predated the Array of Things project. And, and through that, um, it was a it was a series of conversations with city department heads and commissioners, where I was just asking them what what their big challenges were, and that's partly where that list of of needs and desires that that where that came from. It also came from workshops with with scientists, and what the way that the array of things has unfolded and still is is working today is the champion within the city is the chief information officer. It doesn't have to be, it just happens to be that in Chicago. I have a bi-weekly meeting with the chief information officer. I'm on my fourth chief information officer. Um, and we still have these bi-weekly meetings and we talk about not just the array of things project, but other things that um, might be of interest to the city. So in our case, the project manager probably was, I would say me, uh, working in in partnership with a with a department head or in this case a commissioner could have been a different one could have been a different academic but I think that uh, I would say generally and then turn over to, to Chelsea that there's this opportunity for academic researchers to work with city officials in this symbiotic relationship where what we get out of it from academia is relevant research which as you know Jay is necessary if we're going to go get research funding. You have, a you have to have a relevant problem and not just when you think may be relevant. What the city gets is free research, free data analytics. And so if you can figure out some projects and let the needs of the city drive the research, then I think you have a good combination. It could be a set of academics, could be a different commissioner, but I think it's a, it's a team partnership. Yeah. I agree 100%. Um, and I love this question because it gets to the heart of why some smart city projects or efforts or initiatives hit it out of the park and are so successful, like in Chicago, and why some others falter and just can't quite seem to, to get to the next step is because who you have driving the process makes all of the difference. Um, and I think it's cool and kind of interesting that the project manager is the role that's focused on in this question, um, because usually that's the work nobody really wants to do. <laughs> but I think um, in some communities, 
it's an elected official who really pushes the big picture and then folks kind of align underneath that. In other communities, it's a chief information officer, a chief technology officer. Um, in some communities, it comes from very grassroots efforts because there are major challenges in communities that traditional efforts haven't been able to meet. And so wisely, people say, well, how can data analytics and connected technology help us to arrive at solutions better, faster, more equitably. So there's never one single answer. Um, but I think by pulling all of those different, you know, kind of levers and folks around the table, people will self select and sometimes a project managers and academics sometimes it happens within a city. And I also think it's really important for groups like Austin Smart Cities Alliance, where it's a third party kind of twice removed, but the city can be a member industry can be a member academics can be members individuals within the community can be a member. And that's a safe space to start experimenting with some smart city projects and you can assign prod city or assign um, project managers for there so one of the you know kind of issues um, in both a good and a bad way is that there's no one template that you can say this worked in city xyz so we can apply this to every city across the nation it just doesn't work that way but the instigator the champion and charlie i love that you use that word and the project manager are critical critical roles in the communicator yeah i just want to th those are great answers and, and chelsea you really hit to a point that i, I was hoping you would make and for the uh, attendees um the project manager is got to be somebody who's who's relevant to the project being conducted and the stakeholders that are relevant to that project so you know, if Ways didn't exist, you could think Ways was a was a great smart city project that needed to be developed to help with congestion in metro areas, but it could be done entirely by the private sector. On the other hand, a different mobility project that uses video cameras at street intersections to monitor for uh, uh, accidents and for near accidents that might indicate whether the lanes uh, signage, the, the the lights, et cetera, need to be adjusted. That might be entirely a city project and there might be other projects that are combinations of city folks private sector folks academic researchers and so on so it really needs to fit the problem at some level and chelsea hinted this is what we're hoping to help with austin smart city alliance over the next few years figuring out which projects need which stakeholders in them and then design those projects with the right kind of project management so it's a yeah. long challenge we'll see um, Allison, and I might get your last name wrong, Mujeus, uh, she asked a great question. How do you see smart cities impacting lower income slash underserved communities, positively or negatively? Either one of you. <laughs> I, I love this question and I appreciate the integrity and the heart behind it. Um, because a lot of times smart city projects either just look at the system or it's the bright and shiny cool things. Um, you know, we love to celebrate innovation <laughs> in this sector. And a lot of times um, I think the, the equity and, um, and vulnerable communities aren't included by default. However, um, I'm going to give a shameless plug for a technology I've been following and I really love called State of Place. And what they'll do is go in and map an entire city, whatever area is defined, and map the built environment. So we're not collecting data on individuals. It's simply, here's a sidewalk, here's a curb cut, here's a boulevard, here's whatever. Um, and then you can go in and determine what the walkability is, um, where lower socioeconomic areas have uh, less options for transportation, Charlie, to your, to your um, point earlier, and then map those things to air quality, map those things to, um, you know, what they're calling their own state of play. So, you know, very focused on some of the determinants for success and then recommendations on how to improve those things. So um, it's not difficult to measure <laughs> if you're thinking about them as a complex system that all come together. If you're thinking about different smart cities projects as just one lane solving one problem for one group of people, then a lot of times those vulnerable communities are left out. But I think we are getting better at thinking holistically about it? Yeah, I think it's a really good question too. Um, somebody mapped the first set of array of things nodes, a GIS person, and 
kind of graded us on how many of our nodes were in um, under-resourced neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get a particularly good grade, um, but, and this was very early on, but it, I think over time influenced our approach where I would say the following. I, I think that if you think about a smart city project and you first ask, how can this project improve in some fashion, ac improve access, improve whatever air quality, whatever it is, as traffic safety for our vulnerable neighborhoods, then you're, you'll probably end up with a solution that will also help those neighborhoods that are not vulnerable, that are more well off. I don't think the reverse is true. A lot of smart city projects can be done that will help the Tesla driver get a better parking place that will not translate to any benefit and maybe even will exacerbate the difference between the Tesla driver and the person who doesn't own a car. So I think that what we've learned over time, in some cases the hard way from community groups that we interact with is that if we start with how do we make the city, how do we uh, um, lift some of the boats that need lifting the most, then we probably are gonna end up with a better project than you know one that helps the lifted boats be shinier. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I've asked one pragmatic question, one very explicitly people-oriented question. I'm gonna ask now a very future-oriented question uh, from Craig Wheeler, my, my favorite PhD thesis advisor. <laughs> Cities formed in response to the need for direct human interaction in a future dominated by distributed AI and blockchain, will there be a need for cities at all? Hmm. You know, there's a lot of research emerging on this right now. And I think, you know, in pandemic lockdown, it's really caused us to question our desire for human interaction um, and our capacity to acknowledge the complexity of those. So there's some research that says, you know, if when we're in a community bigger than 1400 people, that's when things get messy and things start to break. We don't form our human interactions as much. And so we're needing technology to kind of take over. Um, so I don't know if I'm really answering the question, but I've been thinking a lot about that. And, you know, we're in this era of the mega cities, you know, emerging um, is, is a mega city a more responsible way to live if we can figure out you know, how to decrease air quality because we have better sensors, better information, better systems? Um, or is that not quite the way we want to evolve as, as human beings? I think it's a, a very complex and a very personal, personal conversation. So that's not a smart city answer, that's a human answer. <laughs> Well, Charlie, you want to take I, a crack at it? I, okay, there you go. I think that um, people essentially live in neighborhoods. And some people live in neighborhoods that are surrounded by other neighborhoods that are surrounded by other neighborhoods. And some people, you know, it's like I, I, I lived in Champaign-Urbana at the University of Illinois there. Champaign-Urbana is like a, any neighborhood in Chicago. It's just not it's not our set of neighborhoods. It's just not surrounded by other neighborhoods, it's surrounded by cornfields. Um, so when people think about, so I don't really think of it as a meg, I think we will have mega cities. I think that's, that's going to keep happening. I think the challenge for us is how do we make neighborhoods better? And when I think about Chicago and its 77 neighborhood areas, um, you know, how, that's how we measure life expectancy. That's, you know, that's how we look at the city. How do we make a neighborhood better? I think what we found out from the pandemic or what we are finding out, what I think I'm finding out is, it's great to have the flexibility to work from home if you have a job that allows you to do that. Not everyone does, but people also like to be together. And so I don't think blockchain or smart cities or anything like that is gonna replace you know, uh, the, the mingling of people in, in cities. And we're already seeing in Chicago, there was this, you know, the loop shut down and everyone moved out of, you know, seemed like prices for condos really tanked. And we're seeing that all come back now. So for whatever reason, people like living in cities, the people that live there, maybe not everybody, but. Well, and I, 
I was going to chip in on this just a little bit here, Chelsea. Um, all, the question was, will there be a need for cities? And I think Charlie hit on one of the things. There has definitely been a need for cities historically because most of commerce has been about the physical movement of bodies to places of work and the physical transport of goods to people or the physical acquisition of goods. So as long as the atoms still matter, people are going to have some degree of congregation. Mm -hmm. the, it is true that more jobs are bit oriented, more jobs can be done in more places as long as there's access, but you both had on a really good point. People have a desire for community. Um, there, so there's a want, not just a need. There have been strong needs as well. Not everybody has to live in a city to benefit from a city being nearby. I lived in Fairbanks, Alaska, and we benefited from Anchorage being the one city in Alaska it was less than a day's trip. So if you really needed something that a big city had to offer, you could still get there. And Alaska showed you could do it with only one big city, although Fairbanks as a, as a smaller city had one of almost everything because people didn't want to drive six hours to get to things most of the time. I think that there's certainly um, a decreasing need for some people in some jobs for mega cities, but that even that doesn't mean that they're likely to decrease because some people want that diversity of opportunity and mm -hmm. entertainment and experiences that come from aggregation of neighborhoods of neighborhoods of neighborhoods. And the final thing I was gonna say on this is we call this smart cities, but it's really about smart cities and communities. Mm -hmm. And so even small communities can implement smart technologies that improve quality of life, sustainability, resiliency, safety, health, et cetera. And maybe we should have made that more explicit in the name, but. The purpose of tonight is relevant to communities at all scales. Yeah. The question of whether mega cities need these technologies even more is an interesting one, but I think the existence of those is driven by atoms more than bits and by human nature more than human need. Well, it brings up a really interesting topic, which is, you know, whether we're gathering by riverbanks or gathering in cities you know, for the continuum of humankind, it's all about access to resources. And for some people, that's a luxury because we're choosing to live in cities that have certain amenities that we want slash need. And for some of us, that's an absolute necessity. And I think the yeah. conversation of equity um, can't be dismissed when we're talking about cities, especially when you know the data shows that your zip code determines more about your future success than any other determinant. Um, and I think that if we are collecting the right data in the right ways and it is being purposefully designed to help us design to co-design solutions we can overcome some of those you know limiting um, equity and access issues that have plagued communities as long as for as long as they started forming i have to challenge that a little bit your zip code correlates more highly with success not determines it's not necessarily a cause and effect thing we don't know that yet We'll, we'll have a grammar uh, glossary challenge later. Oh, that uh, causation versus correlation is a huge thing. So, um, but I'm going to go to John Cobbs next. I want to go back to a very pragmatic question. So John says, the idea of fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, is finally beginning to get trans tra uh, traction in scientific data management. What is the equivalent ethical posture for smart city data? And he closes it by saying a simple way to ask this question. How would I get access to streetlight data sets for my personal research, uh, personal slash research slash commercial use? So it's really about findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, and who determines who gets access to what, and, and yeah. what should a person have the right to access? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, what Rahm Emanuel did in Chicago when he arrived in 2011 is he changed the question from um, why should we publish this data to why shouldn't we publish this data? Nice. And there are reasons that some data doesn't get published, you know, health data, education data. Mm -hmm. um, but by, by changing the question, cities like Chicago and I think Austin and, and others have, have published more data in the last 10 years or so than, than has been available before. Um, there's a cost to publishing data that cities have to bear and cities are not flush with cash. So, um, but I think if the mindset is, is, is what 
Rom introduced to Chicago, then we'll be much better off. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of the um, open data initiatives that cities of all sizes have moved down that path, and I think is um, is helping to make it okay to share, as opposed to risky and scary, where you know the lawyers get involved. No offense to our legal community, um, but a lot of times that answer becomes no before it becomes yes. So I like uh, that rephrasing of the question. And also a really great resource, local Austin company, data.world, also a B Corps, so very much a social mission in mind. They take all sorts of data sets um, and make those available to the public for hobbyists, researchers, and everyone in between. So those are, those are always good. Um, I think in the context of smart cities, um, there are some questions that we should be asking city officials when they embark on these projects. And one of those questions is what's the privacy policy? And another is how do I get to the data? What's the data policy? Agreed. And every city should have their own data governance that isn't just crafted only by a few people, but available for public input. I think the more transparent um, and egalitarian that we can be um, about the crafting of those policies, the, the better it, it goes for everyone. All right. Um, I see a great question here from John Stiebel or Stiebel. Or Stiebel. Um, there's probably is not a single answer to this and it probably varies from city to city, but I'd love to get your two answers to it. What is the killer app defined however you like, which can catalyze rapid adoption by smart cities? Or is this unicorn going to be out in the wilderness for another decade? I don't know how to distill it down to a simple app. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Um, well, I don't think there is a single killer app, but I would say most of the problems that cities are trying to solve will not get solved by a killer app. Agreed. I, I think killer app, he has it in capitals, so think of it as quotation marks. I don't think he thinks of it as an app per se, but the, the a project type, for example, something that made it easier to get around in a drastically simpler way or protected public health such that nobody got sick anymore or something like that. What is the smart city application? Let's Fair think enough, of it yeah. that way. I might get into a lot of trouble for saying this um, because it's a... Uh, it's a you know kind of buzzword. Smart city already gets in trouble <laughs> for being a buzzword, but the in, the the idea behind a digital twin, I think, is one of the most interesting things to th start thinking about. So that is mm -hmm. nothing other. Again, I'm simplifying this to the point of ridiculousness, but mapping the built physical environment and simulating different approaches, projects, and applications before they are put into work um, in, in the real world. I think that's a, a killer app, if you will, that can solve a very real purpose in, in my work, which is bringing people together, helping to visualize what the problem is and how that problem gets executed to folks who are not like ourselves and bringing all sorts of different people together so you can discuss it, understand it, and then plot forward without actually having to implement it. I think, I think that's one of the more interesting things that's emerging out of all of this. Yeah, I think that uh, I like Charlie's first answer. There is no single killer app, but it certainly could vary from city to city, depending on what the greatest inequity or constraint or pain point or whatever for that city is. I mean, you'd ask me for Austin uh, before the pandemic, I would have said it would have been mobility related to most of the people with money and affordability related to most of the people without. Um, during the pandemic, the affordability issue, of course, is still there. The ability thing changed a little bit. Yeah. Um, all right. Let, totally interrelated. So yeah. Yeah. Wins, so, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the final question now. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. This is a very pragmatic question. We have lots of good thought provoking questions in here. And I'm going to ask for y'all to consider answering some in the smart city space and turn it over to our audience to answer some on the Slack space as well. So Charlie, I don't know if you want to join this, but you might find that 
there's some interesting questions in here that you want to contribute to chelsea you're already in you may want to answer some list. after the what's that? i will do that um but javier Villarreal asks a really important question how can we incentivize cities to invest in the infrastructure to become smarter we all know that most solutions require money and effort or usually both. How can we incentivize cities to do that? Well, the federal government is incentivizing cities to do that right now with a once in a generation funding opportunity. So I think that is a step um, in the right direction. There's going to be lots of stories and data coming out of all of those decisions. It's going to look very, very different in every community. So um, stay tuned. For but that. Chelsea, how much of that is required to go towards smarter infrastructure as opposed to infrastructure? Um, I don't think there's a clear cut percentage. I think it's up to every community. And if they're smart, there will be a smart component to it. And there's the rub. How do we get them to invest in sm becoming smarter, not just in building wider roads and, yeah. and the like? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? The answer. What's that? I was saying, Charlie, do you have a good answer? It's my shameless punt. <laughs> um, well, a lot of times these federal um, funding opportunities are optimized for 20th solution, 20th century solutions. So, you know, to the degree that new leadership in DC can rethink some of the large scale transportation um, funding mechanisms, that, that would be great. Uh, the fact is that a lot of the dumb infrastructure is, is needing to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. um, bridges, for example, are pretty dumb infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'd like to follow up on before we close with our final slides is it's been something that I've noticed in a city that I have lived in recently and presently is that it's challenging to get them to realize things if it's not a massive savings in life, those are good, or a significant savings in costs since the budgets are often not very flexible. I mean, you, a lot of it is allocated towards services that have to be conducted to protect people, to make sure the city operates. And so the discretionary money in city budgets appears to be down in the single digit percentage. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be able to show projects that have a return, possibly within an election cycle, and even better within an annual budget. Mm -hmm. So if you can show something that's green and saves money in 365 days, well, that, that's really good. That's a, necessarily smart, but it's definitely good. It's showing a financial model that pays off in some period of time. Any, you know, any thoughts from either of you in cities that have done that pretty, pretty well, that have shown something smart would save that city tax revenue that could be used for other problems or something like that? Well, I think, you know, y'all both bring up a really interesting point and I'll do another shameless plug for a startup called Good Roads, where they'll go in and map pavement integrity which helps transportation departments figure out which potholes to fill first or which roads are more likely to be damaged and when and what's needed to mitigate. So that's taking the dumb infrastructure, the budgets that are already allocated to that infrastructure and just helping people make smarter decisions about how to prioritize that. I think that kind of idea and that technology perhaps could be the holy grail where you're not having to do a complete flip, which is hard for city leaders to do. It's hard to adjust that quickly, you know, all the different things that we've already talked about, um, but it's just augmenting information to help prioritize and make better decisions. All right, Charlie, any final thoughts on that before I move on? I think, um, I don't think that there's a magic answer or even end magic answers, but I do think that we'll make more and better progress through partnerships mm -hmm. where before we tell a city what they ought to do, we sit down and make sure we understand what their, what their priorities and constraints are. But so often what happens is we decide what the problem is and then we try to pitch it to the city. And even if it's the right problem, it's maybe not the right time. And, and what happens there is we lose the opportunity to help them solve the right problem at the right time. Yeah. Great final.